breaking ball, hit well, deep to center, roller going back, near the wall, this baby's gonna go! Troy Johnston has a three-run bomb! This is the Turn 2 Podcast with Scott Kornberg and Troy Johnston. Well, Turn 2 fans, welcome back. This is episode four. We are very excited to announce... Our next guest, Owen Cassidy, he is the number three prospect in the Cubs organization. I played against him a bunch in the last year. Um, I was very impressed with the way that he goes about his business, the way he plays baseball, but he has a really interesting backstory that we're really excited to share with you. But before we get to that interview, Scott, I got to say, I'm getting excited for this baseball season to start. We are a week away. I believe the big league starts on the 28th, at least in Miami. And in Jacksonville, we are going to be at home against Gwinnett on the 29th. What are your thoughts coming into this season? Yeah, I I mean, I'm with you. I, I looked at the calendar today. We're recording this on Thursday, March 21st. And so when it comes out, we'll be three days away from our season. And I mean, I'm excited. This is like, for me, the preparation of the season is a lot of work and it gets old. So to feel baseball around the corner, and when you guys get in, Florida, Florida State will play at Jacksonville's ballpark. So those two teams are ranking the top 10 right now. So it gets us a little bit more taste of um, really good baseball. There was a big-time college tournament in Jacksonville a month ago with Iowa, Virginia, Auburn, Wichita State. Those are four good programs, as you know. And then the Savannah Bananas were, were in town. But, I mean, it's still not – none of that's triple A step from the majors baseball. So I'm excited. What about you? I'm, I'm, I'm definitely reaching my point. There's a certain point that every player gets during spring training where they're like, get me out of spring training because there's only so many at bats that actually matter until you get to the actual season. Then every single at bat matters and everything is analyzed and everything's looked at. And I'm to that point where I'm like, get me to the affiliate because I'm ready to 100% compete and give it my all. And so I'm, I'm just excited, and especially with the stadium upgrades and looking at what they're doing in Jacksonville. I'm excited for what they have in store for us this year. Yeah. Going to be a transition year for those who are in Jacks and uh, maybe haven't heard somehow about that stuff, but um, really cool stuff on the horizon, multi-level building in right field. They're going to do an enhanced club space. There's going to be fans on the concourse, which in Jacksonville is, is pretty big. So that's just a handful of the stuff. Like not all the, the plans are quite finalized, but they're close and it's really exciting. Um, everybody, by the way, I was just in spring training last weekend and, and I'm like, I am so happy to be here, right? Like I, I'm getting away from the office. I'm doing major league baseball. Um, I got to see the newly promoted Marlins strength and conditioning coach, Tim Rodmaker, who is one of the best guys in baseball and everybody there was miserable, like, just get me out of here. So that's the thing. Spring <laughs> training is just, I was so happy. And everyone else was like, get me away from this place. I need to go to start the regular season. Yeah. And I think, I think that's a mindset a lot of guys got to work through in a sense, just because it's a daily grind and there's always different times. But when you get into the season, it's kind of more of a schedule. You're going to have a 605 game, a 710, whatever it is is that night you're going to have a noon game. You kind of know what you're looking forward to and you know how to plan. Where in spring training, all of a sudden, the starter can get pulled and then the whole pitching staff will be different and then the whole lineup will be different. You're playing maybe three innings this day and five the next and nine the next and 12 on a backfield one day. Like you just never really know what you're going to have for that day. So getting into the season, you definitely have more of a routine. And you kind of have more things that you can like plan for. I guess that's the only difference. My favorite story this spring, I sent this to you, um, came from Sam Bloom, who's a writer for The Athletic. And he was writing, he's the Angels beat reporter. So he was writing about Angels camp without Shohei Otani. And he wrote about how the biggest concern for the Angels players, and I just thought this was hilarious, wasn't like, man, how are we going to replace arguably the greatest player of all time it was will there still be sushi available <laughs> to eat in the clubhouse before and after games because we lost a japanese player and that was a big part of the menu to make otani feel comfortable even though apparently 
he's not like that big of a, a sushi guy. I just thought that was hilarious. Um, are you guys thinking about, first of all, you guys get catered food in Jacksonville, but is that a big concern when you're going to spring is what is the food going to be? I just thought that that story was so funny. <laughs> so first off, I am a, being from Seattle, I'm a huge sushi fan. Yeah. Me and my wife, we try to get sushi, you know, once a month or something like that. We switch it up pretty much, pretty regularly, but sushi is definitely a main staple in our diet. Um, but looking at like all the catered food for spring training and whatnot, like they treat us really, really well. And so, especially with the new CBA coming out uh, for minor leaguers, for, you know, big leaguers who had a new CBA, what, two years ago, one year ago, something like that. There's mm -hmm. new standards based on food and like, you know, accessibility to food and different things like that. And so, you know, I don't really have things that I look forward to other than food truck Thursday. That's probably my favorite. We they, they bring in a food truck and you get to order your food and you can make it whatever you want and this kind of stuff. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. What's the best food truck? Well, it's only one food truck. It's leftovers. So, okay. But they have different menus every single time that they come. Sometimes they come two times a week. Sometimes they'll just come once. Uh, it's all based on kind of what our clubbies decide. And, but there's some really, really good food. I get the brisket grilled cheese. It's got like Gouda cheese on a sourdough. And I dip it in this like a spicy chipotle aioli. So I'm a spice guy. I like spice. So Me too. See, that's the weird thing. I, you know, but, again, I'll, I'll divert it a little bit. That's the weird thing about Florida. There's not, I haven't found too many spicy, like, like people don't like spice in Florida. It's I don't know. There's a lot of weird things about Florida. I, I like Florida. <laughs> it's a good way to start. I, yeah, I don't want to criticize Florida. I really enjoy Florida. I don't know. It's like the cultures here. You would think there'd be spice, right? Like there's a there's every culture is in Florida for the most part. But yeah, like I you know I I think uh, when I'm in different parts of the country, like certainly my my mom is from Western New York, right? So. When you go to Buffalo, obviously people are going to be eating spicy wings. And by the way, no ranch, got to have blue cheese to make them legit. Um, but yeah, I mean, not that we don't have wings here in Florida, not that there's not spicy food, but it's not like a must have in the diet that I think there are some other things in the state like Cuban food, but that's not, it can be spicy, but not necessarily is. I don't know. It's just, it's an interesting tidbit about it just from going different places. First off, the place that you're talking about in the, in Buffalo, um, I've been to that wing place when I was playing in Batavia, New York. And it was supposed, it's supposedly the very first, the one that invented Buffalo wings. Anchor Bar. Anchor, Anchor Bar. Bar. Yes, Anchor Bar. And I was going to, they do like, they do like shipments. You can ship wings somewhere. And my wife at the time was in Seattle. And I was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to ship her wings. And then it came out to be like a hundred bucks. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm still on a minor league budget. I don't know if I can afford a hundred dollars to ship some chicken wings. This is pre-CBA. It was pre-minor league baseball. Pre-CBA, CBA. yes, correct. Pre-CBA, grinder, grinder minor leagues. <laughs> I'm going to leave the screen. I, I maybe have something from Anchor Bar in my house right now. Really? Um, so if you're watching on YouTube, that's where I'm going. But I love Anchor Bar. And I will show you, you just told me you're, you're living on the west side of Jacksonville. Um, yes. when you get here, there's a great grocery store called Fresh Market and they have this Anchor Bar, the original wing sauce. Oh, that is How a about that? Oh my goodness. And it's just to die for, of course. It's so good. It's so, and my wife is not like a spicy person either. And, um, yeah, she's all about it. Like we, we, this is the sauce that we use. We make our own wings and we have smoker with something you can put them in the oven too. Um, air fryer, all that stuff, but you got to use this. I mean, the flavor is good. It's not overpowering, spicy, where you're you're like sweating and crying. It's just like a perfect amount of heat, but the taste, the flavor, and it's perfect. So, for the listeners here, those that are watching on YouTube, um, Scott is a bit of a chef, as a matter of fact, and he may be humble about it, but I've heard stories and I've seen different you know, pictures of food that he has made. And so tell us, what is your secret to your, your wings? Cause I know they're just going to be awesome. So, I mean, my, my wife and I bought a house last year and I really wanted two things in the house. So this is not answering your question at all, but one 
was a bicycle. The other was a meat smoker. And the best we've made them, and I, I do love Anchor Bar sauce, the best we've made them is in the smoker, and we just season them just a little bit, like salt, pepper, a little bit of garlic, and wow, like you don't even need the sauce. My wife will use the Anchor Bar. I'll put a little bit on for, you know, for my love of Anchor Bar wings, but um, the meat smoker is is something special, like a wood pellet smoker. That is awesome. My mouth is already watering. Well, I think it's time to introduce our next guest, Owen Casey, a Cubs minor leaguer on the rise, ready to take on Chicago. I'm super excited to have him, and let's get rolling. So, I'll give a little bit of background of Owen. I'm going to okay. come real quick. You ready? Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. You're too nervous, yeah. sir. So, right. what, 21 years old. Mm -hmm. You were a second rounder from the Padres yep. in 2020. Mm -hmm. You are in Notre Dame High School in Ontario, yeah. Canada, yeah. which is unbelievable. I got a lot, I got a couple stories about that. Mm -hmm. um, you are currently the Cubs' number three prospect. Correct. Other than, other than that, you came over to the Cubs in the U Darvish trade, which I think the, the Cubs definitely won that trade with getting you over mm -hmm. there. But I just want to talk to you first about it. Um, Twenty-one years old. I know in Canada, 19 is the legal drinking age. Is it different yeah, it is. to is it different coming to the US, you know, and having those different rules being a little bit different, um, being a Canadian coming down to the US? Like what what are your thoughts on that? Um I mean Canadians do I mean historically do like drinking a little earlier than Americans, but uh I mean <laughs> it it really just it doesn't really make a difference um in my opinion if you can vote you should be able to buy a beer okay but uh um no it wasn't that really, really big of an adjustment we just had to wait a little bit but um i'm not a big drinker anyways i'm not gonna lie um so even, no it wasn't really not, big adjustment. Not, even, not even alcohol i'm talking like literally because so for me i'm of course yeah. from the state of washington so i go yeah. up canada i went up to vancouver Mm -hmm. uh, Victoria on the West Coast, and I've also been to Toronto um, yeah. on occasion. So I've spent a lot of time in Canada, and realistically, mm -hmm. of course, you guys traditionally, as firsthand I know, you guys are very yeah. genuine people. But I would say so, yeah. But there are some differences between the U.S. and Canada. Like, was there a culture shock a little bit, or did you spend enough time in the U.S. that it really wasn't much of a transition? So I would always come down to the States as a kid to play like North Carolina, Florida, Georgia, all that for a long time. But like actually living here, I guess the biggest culture shock was the amount of people. <laughs> like literally just the sheer amount of bodies in a, in the area. But um, it's just kind of like a Canada's just basically a smaller brother, little, little brother, tiny brother to the U.S. Yeah, that's really it. The U.S. Okay. Mm -hmm. I like it. I yeah, know. It really, I the Canadian really national is. anthem. It, it's something. I tried, me, I tried to learn it a couple times when I went to a couple Blue Jays games. I tried to sing along. I did my best. Yeah. I got yeah. a little. And of course, do you know any French? Like one percent, like nothing. One percent French. Yeah. So, do yeah. you prefer Spanish or French? Like Spanish. Are you, are you... I think Spanish is easier. Oh, mm. interesting. Mm. Yeah. Oh, wait, right. when you talk I mean, about uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go, 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 go. When you talk about the amount of people, I mean, you're playing in the Cubs organization. And what I remember about working in that organization is is the attention you guys get even in the minor leagues that I would think is an adjustment for anybody, right? Like here in the Marlins system, a little bit of a different fan base. But for the Cubs, they obviously care about the major league team. But in particular, you're part of a wave of a lot of really exciting young players that's trying to bring them back to a championship level. And they, like every game, are checking what they're doing in Myrtle Beach, what they're doing in South Bend, Tennessee, Iowa, and that stuff matters. What's that like to have that attention on you before you've even, even been to the major leagues? I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like, it's kind of crazy, but I try to shut it out. I really don't. In season, I don't. Um, Twitter is a crazy thing. So I really try to not go on Twitter. Um, I mean, it's cool. They really pay attention. Um, the Cubs fan base is pretty legit they travel really, really well but um i really just try not pay attention to it but i know they they really do care that's for sure 
have you have you noticed anything firsthand from that like um you said you said twitter's crazy um is yeah. there is there people that you've had that like because i've heard stories thankfully mm -hmm. i have not been in this situation but if people you have to you had to block you had to delete twitter you had to delete so, some kind of social media is there like has it been too much at a certain point or um, has it been kind of you've been really good at you know filtering through all of it i remember about a year and a half ago a year ago maybe uh in the fall league actually like i was getting some like some like i guess you'd call like like angry angry dms because mm. um and it was basically just like old men that i wouldn't sign for i would sign for the kids or anything like that but it was just like angry old like autograph guys and that's really the only thing i've ever had but i just deleted the dms or i just said thank you and just like exited the dm like they don't deserve my time of day for that but that's really the only thing i've had i guess quote unquote crazy yeah you know, that is that is one of the things I know they go over it all the time. I know you mm -hmm. were probably part of the security meetings with the Cubs. Yeah. They talk about that all the time. And like when you start getting into, you know, higher levels and even similar mm -hmm. to you where you've been a top prospect, you've been a top performer, like people want your attention. Like mm -hmm. having that ability to filter through and try to protect yourself, it's kind of hard as a baseball player to try to keep your circle small. Do you think that you're somebody that – I guess does keep their circle small or do you think that you have like a wide base of people that you can, you reach out to about things? My like circle that? is tiny. Tiny? It is tiny. Yeah. Yeah. I got a small group of guys that I really stay to. Um, obviously like the Cubs, whole entire Cubs org, I'm, you know, friends with everyone, but I really have a small group of guys um, that I hang out with. And um, I think a small circle is a good thing because if ev everybody's your friend, you got too many enemies, right? So yeah yeah that's facts all right scott i want to hear some more about this so how long did you play in myrtle beach like three it, weeks three weeks yeah okay. mm -hmm. three weeks. Was, it, was it low a or high a at the time low a it was low a okay so scott tell me tell me about your experience in myrtle beach and i want to see how it yeah. compares to owen's three weeks in myrtle beach mm -hmm. yeah I, I was there for three years owen so okay um we had the same manager, Buddy Bailey. Mm -hmm. What a beast. For those who don't know, all-time active winningest manager. He's less than 200 wins from becoming the all-time minor league baseball wins manager. Mm -hmm. I loved him. I still love him. I still text him. What, oh, yeah. what was your experience even in three weeks learning from that guy? Because, I mean, he was a part of building the young players of the Braves dynasties in the 90s. Mm -hmm. The Red Sox 04 World Series title. He was in their system and on their major league staff um, in the years before that. Then he came to the Cubs and he's molded the 16 World Series champion. Like that guy has had such a huge hand in All Stars, Hall of Famers, everything. He's seen everything. What did you think about playing for him? Um, he's, in my opinion, my favorite coach so far. Um, he just shoots you straight, and he, he just has a way about him that, I don't know, not many people have. Like, he's so genuine, and he cares so much. But he really doesn't take, I guess, lack of returns, any BS from anyone. Like, none. And um, not to mention, he's like a god in Venezuela in the Winter League. Mm -hmm. Like, he, I think he's the most winning uh, manager there, too. Like, he just, he knows the game of baseball, like, to a T. Like, if he tells you something, you should probably do it because he just has that wisdom about him. Other than that, I'm, I don't know, like, what we have in common from Myrtle because I was there 2016 to 18. Yeah. Um, I mean, the ballpark is awesome. The fan base is mm -hmm. awesome. Right yeah, across is. the street from Broadway. Um, did you ever go to the Grumpy Monk? It's my favorite Myrtle Beach restaurant. Still no, have, I like, didn't. I was only there for like two that. weeks, so there you yeah, go. No, I didn't. Yeah, <laughs> grumpy <laughs> monk. That's funny. I'm breaking all my Myrtle Beach stuff for this episode. You are, yeah. <laughs> Is it? Are we so that was. What's that? Are we a Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp podcast, or are we a Myrtle Beach? I don't know. I'm getting confused. <laughs> you asked me to try to find the differences, Troy. Come on. <laughs> I love it. So, Owen, oh, like. 
that was your intro to pro baseball, right? Because you're, you're drafted by the Padres, but it's 2020, so there's no minor league baseball. And you're um, traded to the Cubs in 2020. Was that your intro? Was playing for Buddy Bailey and, and the Myrtle Beach Pelicans? I'll, I'll take you through my like, like journey. So I got drafted. And I actually did really cool by the Padres. I respect them for this. They took me, they took me to the alternate site in 2020. And so I was actually getting like ABs as a 17 year old against big leaguers and like big league reserve guys in 2020. I was there for about a month and a half, went home, uh, did instructs with the Padres, got traded. And then my first taste of, I guess, actual like data logged professional baseball was the Arizona league, the ACL. Um, and then I, I killed it. And then I went up there for like three weeks. So that was my first taste, I guess, like of like affiliated ball was with Buddy Bailey. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So I'm pretty fortunate for that. So we were talking about your journey. Yeah. Being a, you know, second rounder yep. for the Padres, what was like your deciding factor on what, first off, where were you committed to go to college? I couldn't Michigan. find Michigan. 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 Yeah. Ooh. yeah. Okay. So what was your deciding factor on, you know, being 17 years old and deciding to play professional baseball versus going to fulfill your commitment to Michigan? Um, I'm just a baseball player. Like I didn't, I didn't really want to like do school and I just felt it was right. Um, my biggest thing, my parent, my mom was like, she really wanted to go to, go to school. She was kind of worried that I was going to miss the education part. But when she learned about when they give you money for school after you're done, she was like, Oh, she was like, go to pro ball. So my family and I were all really like into it. I didn't really think I was going to get drafted or I didn't have a shot until like, I guess, middle of 11th grade. Um, but being 17, pretty young for being drafted. Um, it was, it just kind of felt right. And I needed to get into it. And it's really wanted what, what I wanted to do in my heart. And uh, it was a happy day in the uh, Casey household. If that's for sure. Yeah. I love it. That is and see, there's so many kids out there that are going to be watching this podcast that are like, you know, and even I have some guys that I was training that are 16, mm -hmm. 17 years old, going to be in the same yeah. situation that you are. And to hear them or to hear you say it just felt right. I think that is the biggest yeah. thing. Like, you yeah. Have to oh, yeah. I mean, you can't do something that doesn't feel right. You got to always follow, I guess, you got to think with your head, but you got to follow it with your heart. And if you can, like, kind of make those two, like, coincide with each other, like, you're not going to make the wrong decision at the end of the day, in my opinion, because either way is a good idea, college or pro ball. It's just what you and your family ultimately want to do and what you like will, what will benefit you the most, in my opinion. Yeah, mm -hmm. I totally agree. So I'm going to jump forward a little bit. So we yep. asked you about your, you know, how you got drafted, everything like this. Um, I want to jump forward a little bit to this spring. Um, yeah. Talking about what you came in after a stellar year last year, you were in all minor league first team. Um, your stats, I'll pump you up again real quick. Um, a 289 average with a 917 OPS and 22 home runs. I'm really upset you couldn't get the 23rd, you know, get it over there in Knoxville, whatever. But coming into this year, after having a stellar year last year in 2023, was there anything that you were hoping to like work on or get better at? Um, coming into the spring training spring training with the hitting side of things just continue to do me and focus on my plan and my goals really just like hitting line drives up the middle and being on time but what i really wanted to get better at was being a uh, better base runner and better outfielder mm -hmm. um because they value those two what, at does, a that level. what does that entail Pardon? being a better base runner and better outfielder what, what did you specifically work on like baseball iq like picking up little tips little tricks like if one thing I learned this year, and I saw it multiple times in big league spring training and the minor league spring training here too, if a pitcher shakes twice, he already wants to, he knows what he wants to throw and I'm mm. going to take off. I'm going to go. If you shake twice, the pitcher is preset already on what he wants to do. And he's so focused on that. He, he basically forgot about you. And I saw it and I seen it so many times this spring and I never, never thought about it. Our first base coach, Mike Napoli, he was like, he is a wizard. Like he would tell me stuff. I'd be like, whoa, never thought of that. And it boom, every game I see it. And so, um go ahead. sorry, with the bit with the outfielding, it's just really just like honing my craft. It's just really because honestly, being from Canada, 
we get a, especially if you're an outfielder, you get a slow start on outfielding because I'm inside in high school and all my life for, damn, nine months of the year. So he's just really getting like let reps. That's it. That's awesome. Are you, when you are a base stealer, are you a hop, hop, go guy? Are you a straight steal? Because you got speed. So mm -hmm. straight steal. Okay. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not the best of the hop. I can do the hop, hop at second. Yeah. It's a lot easier. The first, the first, the first is a little tough for me. So I just straight steal. Yeah. Yeah. So I really hope, um, let's see. So you've been reassigned. I don't think, Scott, do we play Iowa this year? No, no, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. We do not have the privilege. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Thank goodness our pitchers are going to have a, you know, they're going to be safe for one week because Owen, oh, oh. it will not be hitting home run after home run after double against us. Oh, my goodness. So what was, like, the biggest takeaway then when you were in big league camp? Um, what yep. was the biggest takeaway that you learned other than, like, you, you're talking about doing you and you're talking about getting better at offense? What was, like, the biggest thing, whether you learned it from a vet, from a coach, that you were like, I can't wait to do this during the season, or I can't wait to take this, you know, technique, this mental technique, physical, whatever it is, into the season. I'm trying to think. Tough question, I know. It is a tough question. Um, dude, I'm not gonna lie. I don't think one thing. Like really, just do you? Like, I'm really trying to think. Maybe here, um, I'll give you an example right here. Maybe okay. it's how, maybe like to spark it, maybe how to act in a big league locker room. Maybe how to. Okay, that was, that was something that I, I was big doing with. Yeah, I mean, I had my exit meeting with Craig Council. Um, uh, and he was like, what, what was one big takeaway you had? I was like, really just how guys um, go about their business and their days. And like, he was like, good. And he said, this is how they act in the big leagues. Obviously, when it's in season, they want to win more, but this is how it is regularly, not regularly. Um, but like, ooh, there we go. Um, but it was really just on how to be a big leaguer and um, just carrying myself. And I felt like I did a good job of it, but um, it was just nice to see it. I don't know, I don't know if that's a takeaway, but um, actually, I got one right here. It's oh, he's got another one. Um, ooh, we get an yeah, edge yeah. Off or um, I really noticed that um, the good big leaguers that were in the clubhouse focused on everything, not just one part of their game. Like Nico Horner, good hitter, but like he really focuses on every part of his game. And I really saw that to like to a T. Like I, just, I heard about it and I thought, oh, you know, you can hit your way to the big leagues, which is true. But then you got to hit in the big leagues and you got to do other things really well to stay in the big leagues. And that just kind of stuck with me. Yeah. What's uh, what's Craig Council like? First year as a Cubs manager, and he had so much he's hilarious. experience and winning in in Milwaukee. Like he's he's fantastic, supposedly. Yeah, he's he's a really really genuine guy, and he's super easy to talk to, and he's he's funny. He's a funny guy. Yeah, it's like cracking yeah, he's funny. all the time. Funny oh, or like yeah, is just, it dry, just we'll, is it dry humor. Yeah, it's dry, and he'll just roast you. <laughs> but it's like it's funny. So we would do like. Actually, this is funny. On the first day of Big League Camp, or first or second day of Big League Camp, um, we did a introduce yourself, one vet and one rookie. And so we called up Jan Gomes, vet. I think he played in the league for like 12 years, something like that. And then he just beelines the right to me after he's done. He says, Case, you're up. So I had to, I had to do a, where I'm from, what round, sign bonus, and then whatever questions they had for me. And it was like, oh, why do you think you have red hair? Or do you red, does red hair make you have – or like, does red hair make you hit bombs? Does being Canadian, you know, make you better at hockey? And I was, oh, my gosh. It was it was funny. But he's a really good manager. Yeah. That is fun. That, that might be the first time I've heard of something like that. Oh, that yeah. is so creative. That yeah, is great. Bonding, bonding activity mm -hmm. to, like, kind of learn something about the younger guys. And Yeah. Everybody knows stuff about that. The, the, the veterans are so prominent in the media and like everything. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, interesting how they did that. I might have to, mm -hmm. I'll have to take that out of, take that, take notes in that or whatnot. So you did, mm -hmm. you did have something, say something interesting. So you said something about hockey. Yeah. Were you a hockey player growing up? Uh, for a little while. Okay. And then 
I kind of scrapped it. I'm not going to lie. The only reason why I scrapped it, because I wasn't allowed to play, because my mom didn't like the hockey parents, because they were absolutely crazy in Canada. Oh, yeah. I, can, I can imagine. It's so, like, did you, play, did you play ice hockey? Yep. Yeah, I played it as a little kid. And, you know, I know how to skate and everything like that. Um, like backyard pond hockey, everything like that. Played that. I just never really played affiliated hockey, I guess, because. A, playing baseball and hockey was just too expensive. And B, the parents are like Southern high school dad, football dads, times like 30 on steroids. Like it is nothing you've seen before. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So that's one of the big reason why, because parents didn't like the, uh, the um, scene of the, all the other adults. But, um, and I just like baseball better. Plain and simple. Yeah. Did you play any other sports growing up as well? I was actually pretty good at soccer when I was young. Like up until I was probably like 13, 14, I stopped. I had to make a choice between soccer and baseball. Um, now looking at it, I'm way too big for soccer. So I think I made the good, good choice. Yeah, true. But um, I did like baseball by far more than anything else. Yeah. Your your mom played softball, right? So, did, what kind of influence did she have on you growing up? Um, she had she my mom has always been a big sports fan. Um, more than my dad, honestly, like she knows honestly almost more about like baseball and football than my dad. My dad was a hockey guy and baseball, but they really just influenced me to play baseball. Um, and they were great. You know, they stayed out of my business and just let me do me for a long time, and um, let me develop as a person and a player um but it was pretty big you know we're a pretty big uh, baseball household which is pretty rare in canada it's pretty much always like lacrosse or hockey but it was good because it was kind of like a change of scenery and it was just nice to be able to be supported by two parents who enjoyed the game yeah. i have i have an interesting question and you yeah. probably have no idea who this team is because it's the total mm -hmm. opposite side of course it's in bc and not ontario yeah. But have you ever heard of the Langley Blaze? Of course. I played a tournament with them uh, in Jupiter, Florida in 2019. And with they were just the, here. With the yeah, Langley Blaze? They were Blaze. just here. Yep. Oh, my goodness. We would go up. So my, of course, my team was probably, I was probably four hours south of Langley, yep. three hours south. And so we would play them every single summer. And it was so interesting because they only played with wood bats. So we mm -hmm. would go up and play with wood bats. And I didn't realize at that time when I was so young, I was like, oh, wood bats, it's nothing. But they were significantly better with wood bats. Every oh, yeah. time we played them, it was unbelievable. And they this wall out right. Do you have you ever been to that to their field? I know what it looks like. So they have the wall out in right field that has mm -hmm. all of the draft picks or the former. Oh, they're a bit. They're a powerhouse in Canada. They are an absolute powerhouse. Yeah. I think that is yeah, so cool that it's such a small world that even you know that team. Uh -huh. they, they were literally just here playing against our, our AZL team, and they. They dogged them. Langley Blaze killed them like nine to one. Yeah. But what's new? They would do that to us too. It's okay. Yeah. They'd invite mm -hmm. us up. They'd be like, oh, we'll have a good old time and then beat us 10 to zero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're pretty good. Their pitchers are good. Yes. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's funny. What, what is Langley Blaze? Is this like a, it's like a pennant league team? High school summer, no, high school summer ball team. Okay. It's like, and so what we got in Canada. In Canada, we really don't do high school baseball. It's not really a thing because not many kids play baseball, so the teams just aren't good enough. So it's basically a travel ball team for the summer. So we just – where I'm from, it's – I play for the Phyllis Pirates. Another powerhouse in Canada is the Ontario Blue Jays, like all the Naylor, Naylor brothers. They play, They went there. And then there's another one called the Grey Lake Canadians who have a couple of draft picks. And then in Alberta, beside British Columbia – it's, I think, the Okotoks Dogs. So that's actually an academy. And Ooh, Boxall. Okay. And that's an academy, too. And then there's a bunch in BC. So we kind of make, like, I guess, hubs for baseball. And, like, all the kids will just go there who are around there. And then we'll go down south to play in the summer and train there in the winter. Yeah, it's like club ball, pretty much. Okay. It's a different, a different world. Yeah. But you're so, so – so Go ahead. Go ahead, Scott. No, Troy, go, go ahead. When you were growing up, 
and training. So for me, being from the north as well, it was always cold outside. Mm-hmm. It was always raining. Mm-hmm. For you, potentially even snow. Mm-hmm. Did you guys have a lot of indoor facilities that you had access oh. to train? Oh yeah, I, had, I I was actually very very fortunate. So the facility I trained at for the first couple of years of my, I think from twelve years old to about fourteen or fifteen years old, we were in a pretty small facility with just two cages and maybe like. 45 yards of turf space, 45 yards length by like 20 yards width, not very big, but then they upgraded to like, I'm talking like 50,000 square feet of turf and like eight cages, like jumbo cages. So you can look it up. You can look up Fieldhouse Pirates Athletics, Bronson, Ontario, and you can see pictures. It is, it is very, very good. Like even like the other ones, like Ontario Blue Jays and Great Lake Canadians, like the facilities are massive. There's so many cages. Um, the one biggest thing in Canada is I don't think there's good enough coaching. Hmm. Because because why would a guy, say an ex-pro guy, ex-big leaguer, they are from Canada, you know, they're used to being in the cold, and then they get down to the States. And, I mean, I, personally, I'm not going to leave the States. I'm going to stay down here. Why would I go back up to the cold, right? So it's kind of like that dissociation from – the guys who make it through the cracks and get to the pro ball and um, they don't go back home because why would you want to go back home when you can stay down South? So when I'm done playing, I do want to help out because I do feel like it would be nice for me to spread knowledge to the kids who need it rather than then trying to find their way, which is tough, especially in the Canadian baseball scene because there's not much help. Yeah. Speaking of the Canadian baseball scene, you were a part of Team Canada, correct? Yes, the best experience of my life. Best experience of your life. So yep. tell us a little bit about that. How did you get recruited to do that? How, what What was it like going down? Were you in the Miami part or were you in um, overseas? I was in Arizona. You were in Arizona. Oh, my fault. My fault. Perfect. You're no, you're good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So start us off from there. So I'll go backtrack a little bit. I played for the junior national team in high school. So they already knew who I was, um, played for the U18 team in high school. And then I think like, I knew, I knew the WBC was coming up and uh, I was like, Hmm, I wonder if they're going to, you know, take me. So I get a call one day from one of the baseball Canada guys, Greg Hamilton, great person. Um, been in baseball Canada for a long time. He calls me, he says, Hey, Owen, he says, do you want to play for the WBC team? I was like, yeah. He's like, perfect. He's like, have a good day. I was like, I got one question. I was like, Are you, am I going to play? Because I won't come if I'm not going to play. I don't want to waste my spring training to sit on the bench. And he was like, well, okay, we'll see. I was like, no, 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 no. I need to know. He's like, yeah, we'll play you. I'm like, perfect. So I got like, I don't know how many ABs, but that playing in WBC catapulted my season for sure. That is awesome. Mm-hmm. What, was, what was the experience like? Did you learn anything from it? Was it just, I'm going to take this all in and do my best like what 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 did you get um, from playing in the WBC so going into it I was like I'm gonna just play and see what happens and I can't be mad because I know that every day I did 100% to represent my country but what my biggest takeaway from it was I belonged with big leaders and that I wasn't and I knew that I could be just as good as them and better because I play with you know my the team is full of big leaders and I played against big leaders and it's just up here and um I really got a sense of belonging and uh, just like reassurance that I, you know, I'm in this for a reason. And it was just because that's the biggest stage I've played on so far was the WBC. You know, like I'm on the field with freaking Mike Trout, Mookie Betts, Nolan Arenado, like all that stuff and not being afraid and feeling like I belonged was the biggest thing for sure. You know, Owen, I'm, I'm going to be really personal with you right now that yeah is going to be the reason why you are going to be so successful in this game and you are going to go a long, long ways. And I know you probably hear that all the time, but coming from another player that I I know I reached out to you because I think you're a good player, you're a good person, you have a really interesting story, but that mentality is what a lot of players lack, whether you are at the major league level, whether you are in high school, whether you are in little league, a lot of people lack that mindset saying, I belong. I belong to play here. I deserve to play here because I put in the work because I know mm-hmm. I'm good enough, that kind of stuff. And that's, you know, anybody's listening, 
and you can pass that on to somebody that you know that's playing just that is the biggest mindset change that i've seen from talking to big leaguers talking to expert, oh, yeah. talking to coaches that is the mindset that is the only thing that truly matters in this game for sure and like i didn't get that sense of belonging without my preparation and you know you know about that too it's like we prepare so much and then when you finally get there it's like okay you know did i that do enough and i wouldn't say that i second guess myself it's just you kind of like look yourself in the mirror and be like you got this and then yeah like you know about it um but yeah the wbc was great and i got to play alongside freddie freeman which was pretty cool one of the best to do it yep mm -hmm. you mentioned the uh the, the coaching did you feel like maybe that like going to the states Cubs organization, Padres organization, did that unlock a part of your game that maybe hadn't been unlocked before when you were younger? So when I was younger, I was very fortunate to have good coaches around me. But I feel like in Canada, it's tough to find them. They're very few and far between. But when I got the pro ball, um, I really just honed in on myself. And I would talk to guys. I would hear like big leaguers talk. Say if I was in the cage one time, or like even like up and down guys, like cup of coffee guys. Like I remember one time and I was in the AZL and Alfonso Rivas, a guy who's been with the Cubs and fit. He's like an up and down guy, um, great player. But he really just told me, he's like, he's like, whatever you do, um, just be you and trust in your work, but never give up. And I was like, okay. You know, I really took it to heart. But um, I would say, yeah, the Cubs really helped me. You know, I made a – on the Padres, I was really, really wide, like my stance. And as soon as I got to the Cubs, they stood me up, and that was like boom, like it was like a world of difference. Whereas, um, that's the one major thing that happened when I got to the Cubs was that swing change. But they also have a really good mental department too. Um, and I have a like with the Cubs, it's like a big family, which is really really nice. Like they take really really good care of their minor leaguers, which is. It, what I from what I hear from my other buddies from other orgs, it's Cubs are far ahead. I don't know about the Marlins, but um, you know the Cubs do a really really good job of taking care of their guys. That's good. That is so. That's good to hear. I like that. Well, I remember. So I'll sidebar a little bit. I was part of the yeah. Mesa Solar Sox as well, and I know you played in the fall yep. league in was it twenty two or twenty twenty two twenty two. Okay, so you yeah. played in twenty two, um, year after me. I mean, what was that experience like as well? Because, of course, that almost like you pretty much had a full year of baseball then at that point because you were yeah. ball, then you were WBC, then you roll right into, right into the double A. Yeah. yeah, right to double A. Like, was that a different experience as well? And especially being at your home park? Yeah. Is that what, um, what being a Mesa Solar Shop? I'm not going to lie. I sucked in the fall league. <laughs> oh, I was horrible. Um, but – you know, with failure, you learn. So, like, I learned why. Like, I was, like, in it. I was, like, oh, shoot. But then when I, I got out of it and I reflected, I was, like, why Why did I, you know, what happened here? Why did I, why did I suck? And I learned about myself. And I think it was a really, really good learning experience. But it was cool playing at home. My Solar Sox, Arizona Fall League. I, I, did, I did it. Um, But then I learned a lot about myself. So, I could really you know, focus up and get ready for WBC and um, really just hone my craft. So like going from, I was horrible, learning why I was horrible. And then going into that season, it was, it was good for me. I needed to get my butt kicked a little bit. Good. Everything yeah. happens for a reason. I like it. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, oh, and one more question for you. Mm -hmm. The, the Canada stuff is so cool to me. And you grew up, I believe, within driving distance of Toronto. So yep. how big of a role did the Blue Jays play in your life growing up and maybe helping establish a love for baseball? Probably one of the biggest roles. Um, like, to this day, I'm still a Toronto Blue Jays fan. And I always will be. Um, I never missed a game when I was a kid. Um, you know, always like I, I remember I had my mom has pictures of me like sitting on the ground, like holding my glove, my bat, watching the game. Um, and like I don't know. I love the Toronto Blue Jays, uh, just as like a fan of baseball. I always will. Um, 
but they play a massive role in me growing up liking baseball. Um, like those early teams, like the 15, 16, when they made the, went to the playoffs, didn't get that far, but like they were just mashing home runs. Um, very, very big. And I also like played there in high school too. Um, the, this academy called tournament 12 would hold, would host, um, a tournament at the Rogers Center and every province would would create a team and we could go play in the Rogers Center and it was just great. Um Canada baseball Canada is getting better. Uh it's gonna continue to get better. But uh it was really cool. I also did a home run derby there too, which is sick. And I won. So it was nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll throw that in there okay. Yeah, I won. Yeah. Well <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. Mm-hmm. Well, oh, and you have been awesome. Scott, do you have any more questions for him? No, I want to see if he can win plate appearance. That's that's the, that's my next step. Thank you. All right, so I have a game set up that we have with okay. all hosts. It is a trivia okay. game about baseball. The rules of plate appearance is I'm going to give you 10 questions. Good okay. luck to all through all 10. The first question mm-hmm. is going to be worth a single. So we're going to play it like a baseball game. First all question right. is going to be a single. Second question is going to be a double. Third question is going to be a triple. Then we're going to go back to the a single for the fourth question and so on. Okay. So I kind of press you on that. If you do get three questions wrong, you are out. I do have to tell okay. you, it's really hard to score runs in this game, but okay. I think you'll do just fine. All mm-hmm. right. So with yeah. our very first question for a single, let's go with this. Who was the 2023 NL MVP? Oh my God. Oh, um, Acuna. Oh. He's got a runner on first. Yeah, I do. And yeah. 110 through the middle. Runner on first. All right. And now for a double. Like I said, for a double, it's going to get a little bit tougher. What is the most used bat brand in baseball? Right now? Yeah. In the major leagues? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, think, I think it switched over to Victus. No, I really want to give you the answer. No so way, is it Marucci? That owns Victus. Yes, it's a company that owns Victus. Damn. Okay, yeah. Okay. I know. I know. How? I'll give you. I'll give you a half point for that. But it's no. Not don't do, don't give me a half point. I was wrong. Don't <laughs> give me yeah. half point. You want to earn <laughs> yeah. it? Right. So yeah. we got one out. Runner on first. This one is going to be for a triple. Yep. This one's going to be for a triple. Let me get to my questions. Questions for a triple. All right. Ooh, this one's going to be tough. I've, I've asked this mm-hmm. once before. Of the 16 franchises of the modern two-league era, which one has never won more than 100 games during a regular season? This is the uh, not-so-great baseball team question, I guess. Who hasn't been good in the last little bit? Nationals. Good guess. Good guess. Chicago White Sox. No. Chicago White Sox. Damn, I didn't know that. Yeah. It's it's one of the questions we've been pulling up. We've been pulling up different interesting questions all the time. Yeah, so two you've, been, you've, been good, you've been pretty good so far. Literally, there's a couple of people that did not get any yet. So, let's see where was I? Okay, so next one we're gonna go back to a single. Okay. Who is the 2024 minor league top prospect? Holiday. Yep, Holiday. All right, we got yeah. another single. So we got first and second, two yeah. outs. Back against the ball, needs to score here. All right. Give me a double. Give me a double, here we go. Ooh, here's a good one. Which player holds the record for most MVPs? Most MVPs? Most MVPs. (sighs) Shoot. Um, Is it a a pitcher or a hitter? Hitter. I'll give you you a, a, a hint. Hitter. Damn. Um. I really don't know. I'm gonna just say. Right, here you, go. you ready? I'll give you a. I'm gonna just say Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron. That's pretty yeah. good. Barry Bonds. Good guess. Barry Bonds is the most MVPs, and he's not in the Hall of Fame. Did he win seven? I think. Yeah. I think he's. Got yeah. Seven. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. he knows his baseball trivia. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I, gotta, I knew he was. I, I gotta switch these questions up because that was pretty. That was still pretty good. Yeah. Damn. Oh, okay. Yeah. Congratulations. You had a runner on first and second. No runs on that one. So I think you are 
tied for second on the leaderboard. Who scored a run? Ryan was it Ryan Lavarnway? Ryan Lavarnway. Okay. Ryan Lavarnway scored two or three runs. He scored two or three runs. Who? Oh wow. Okay. He was very was good. Was he in camp with you guys? Was he in camp with you guys? He's oh, a yeah, coach. Ryan. Yeah. He's working for the Cubs, isn't he? Yeah. Lavarnway. How do you spell his last name? Lavarnway. L A V A V A R N W A Y. Oh, catching yeah, can you catching rover? You know what's funny? I literally just met him like three days ago. Yeah, he is. He was our very first guest, and he is an. I played with him in 2022. He is an absolute yeah. awesome human being. So if you ever oh, yeah. have questions, just tell him. Tell him you know me. He'll probably say some smart remark about it. Something funny. Yep. But he, you can even say say it about Scott too. But he is an awesome, awesome human being. Yeah, he's a really nice guy. Yeah. Okay. All right, Owen, yeah. you have been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us on Turn Two. Thank you. With Scott and Troy, we will be back again in two weeks, I believe, for the season opener. Um, no, we'll be, that, we'll be playing this season. We're, we're going to see Owen. Owen's been <laughs> batting 400 going to the majors. And Troy, same thing for you. That'd be nice. No pressure. Guys. <laughs> That'd be and nice. Yeah. You can catch Owen in a Iowa Cubs jersey Hopefully. for about two or three weeks. And then he will be in a Chicago Cubs. So Chicago Cubs fans. Be ready. He is coming. He is ready. He hits mm-hmm. balls very hard, and he plays great defense. And now he knows how to base run. That is incredible. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. That was Owen Casey. I am so impressed with the way that he thinks about baseball. Not only – of course, I've been a part of being on the other team while he's played, but the way that his confidence, his background, everything has, that has led up to the point – that he is in his career. I, I'm just so impressed. Scott, what was like a big takeaway from that interview we just had for you? I I love this stuff. You know, I really thought he got pretty into it talking about Canada. And it's something that I think both of us are from the United States and having traveled to a little bit of foreign nations. I just don't think that Americans have the same sort of passion in their representing their country that somebody from Canada or we're, we're talking about my honeymoon, Portugal, um, I've been to Israel, like those kind of places. I just think it's a different level of country pride that maybe we don't have. And hearing him talk about what it was like to represent Canada, I just thought that was a really cool moment for me. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, the more we talk about it, I think we're going to turn into a travel podcast here soon. <laughs> but we're gonna we're gonna go away from the baseball and we're gonna travel. But I'm just I'm just so impressed with you know the way that he holds himself at such a young age. Yeah. And you know we t- we talk about you know him being 21 years old like that is very young in the game of baseball and he's being pushed very fast by the Cubs. I'm really excited to see how his career is going to flourish, especially when he gets that shot, whether it's with the Cubs this year, whether it's with a different team. Just like we talk about as players all the time, there's 29 other teams. And just like you even think about, there's 29 other teams that you can have opportunities for promotion. And so I think that's kind of the more interesting part is he is right on the cusp. And all of those that background that we talk about, that Canadian background, I wonder if that's, you know, led into it, a little, made him a little bit gritty being up there in the snow and the cold and now able to fully immerse himself in, like we talked about, the coaching is different, the atmosphere is different you know how he trains is different but i thought i thought he was awesome i thought i really enjoyed our conversation i I, you know it's interesting the cubs i think about where they're at as a franchise and it's kind of like where the marlins were at a year ago where it's like team that's close can they figure it out and the cubs collapsed in september really and this year you know you you hope that justin Steele takes another step forward uh great guy by the way Cody Bellinger, you got him back. A lot of these young guys like Christopher Morrell, like, can they take another step forward? And in that division, all those teams are flawed, but all of them have a shot, right? Like, you could easily make a case for the Cardinals, Reds, Cubs, Milwaukee, and Pittsburgh even, that if things break right, any of those teams can win 85, 86, 88 games or so and win the division. Like, it's not like the National League East – or the National League West, where you're going to need 100 wins to win it, you don't need that. And and so a guy like Owen, he might start the year in Double A AA or Triple A, 
But if he does what he did last year, he's clearly highly thought of. Either he's a piece to bring in somebody for the Cubs, or he's a guy who could play outfield at Wrigley and be an impact guy in the second half to maybe push him towards a playoff spot. I mean, they're right on the cusp where somebody like that is so valuable to me. Well, what an interesting guy. You know, I got to say thank you guys for listening. I really appreciate everything that, you know, Turn 2 family has been tuning in. I love getting all the texts, all the replies, everything like that. I just want to thank you guys one more time for tuning in to our show. We are so appreciative. And other than that, we will see you on next episode. And that's the ball game. Thanks for listening to this episode of Turn 2 Podcast with Scott and Troy. A huge thanks to Ken Babby, Harold Craw, Linda McNabb, Mo Blaha, Matt Goodrow, David Ratz, Gillian Bay, and the rest of the Jumbo Shrimp staff for their continued support.